Okay, we start with the storage strength bit. Okay, this is from Graham Nuttall, who's a New Zealand um, psycho um, educational psychologist and educational researcher. Um, he wrote a book called The Hidden Lives of Learners. Absolutely fantastic book. And just like Rachel talked about lesson study, his research was looking at the students, not what the teachers do, but looking at what actually happens in the classroom with the students. It is a fantastic book. Okay. He talks about a lot of things about feedback and so on, but one thing that really stood out was this bit here. He didn't intentionally go to find this, but he found out that students, for all over the studies he did, actually, if they were going to learn a new piece of information that was going to get committed from the work in memory into long-term memory, they needed to, in the short term, when they were introduced to that particular topic, to have covered it, or been introduced to it, about three or four different ways. In our lessons now, we now have a few people taking photo of this, so I can't talk about this bit first. Um, he's not talking about that in your lesson you introduce the topic and then simply repeat the topic to the <coughs> end and repeat it a third time. He's not talking about that because you're using that same piece of information the same way. He's talking about in his book that the fact that it's to get students to use that information in different ways. So maybe you introduce it to them, maybe they've got to break it down, maybe they've got to answer a higher order question based on it and so on. So that student's manipulating that piece of information. And actually he talks about, when you've introduced the information, you need to do this in the very first couple of days of learning it. So if you're in one of those subjects where you've got a lesson on a Monday and a Tuesday, maybe a Thursday, <coughs> you cover that new topic, that new information, those three or four different ways, in those first few out of a few days, okay? And that's got more chance as students are working with it, to develop that story strength, it gets committed from the working memory into long-term memory. Now we had a problem, because our lessons happen once a week for our theory. So we don't have the luxury of um, having the, the Tuesday followed by the Wednesday and the Thursday. We had a whole seven days before we were going to cover it again. And then this effect, which we call three's a magic number for ourselves just to remember it, doesn't really work for us. So we've had to look at our lesson plans, we'll show you in a moment what we've done, to try and make sure that when we are delivering that new information, that in that 24 hours, we were getting students to use it three or four different ways. Yeah, maybe the way we introduce it, we had a Twitter account, so makes the way that we then our students to do uh, stuff and tweet things out to them, we use it modo to sort discussions and so on, over the homework, maybe even in our lesson, making sure that we're uh, in introducing it at the start, get them to manipulate it, get them to think at an extended level at the top uh, with it. So they've got that constant work with that new information so the storage strength increases and more chance they're getting committed to their working memory. Uh, it's a long term memory. One of the desirable difficulties which uh, Robert Bjork talks about is um, Getting students to build learning on prior knowledge and stuff like that. Okay? If we're going into a lesson where we're trying to get students to do something really, really high level, quite challenging, if they haven't got the background knowledge or the background information or the understanding to actually be able to comprehend or even do that particular task, they're not going to have a chance to learn it and put it forward to their long term memory. Okay? So we've worked very hard this year to restructure our course. I'm going to show you our template, our overview in a moment where we've kind of designed it so lesson one leads to lesson two and lesson three leads lesson one and two to get to three and four leads one, two and three. Now that may be a bit of a fat for us, a bit of a fat for us, but we're trying to get it so students when they get say now in March can access and we can challenge, we can stretch, we can talk about old stuff because we've got that prior knowledge to help develop that new knowledge. Because a lot of the stuff we do with students, they kind of know already because they, they've heard it in science or the world of sport, <coughs> they've heard it in the media and so on. But we try and need to make the technical element there, so we try and structure it in order. And we'll show you how we've actually mapped that out. Another one is something called interleaving. Bjork talks really quite in depth, actually, about the process of interleaving. About the fact that we need to be trying to constantly connect topics within each other so they are constantly accessing other topics with new topics and it's that bringing back and talking about something we learned six months ago, three months ago, last week, that constant reference to them, that desirable difficulty there and our students have that constant trigger and it builds up their storage strength and their retrieval strength. Okay? The more we make reference to old things, old learning, old knowledge, then the more chance it is that the students are going to remember it when they come to new stuff as well and the tests and things like that. Now, we'll show you our PowerPoint, uh, our, 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 the way we've, we've processed it to lead them into it. Um, Bjork in his book actually talks about, or in his research, that it should be that we do, today we do a bit of um, 
gender in sport, tomorrow we do some diet in sport, then the next lesson we do a bit of um, psychology in sport, then we go back to gender in sport, then to diet in sport, and we physically can't map that out in our lesson, okay? We can't have it so sporadic yet. We're not at that level where, unless we did like a long-term project where we mapped in lots of different topics and those topics did interleave like that, we've had to reorder the way that we teach our subjects so that one thing leads to the next and it builds upon the primaries that we had. Another thing, spacing, okay? Spacing is a great way of trying to get that retrieval strength developed. Now, it's linked to a little bit of testing, which we'll talk about in a moment, but if we are constantly revisiting old topics over time, and we are increasing that time between revisiting it, it gets to the stage where students almost forget it. Now, this is, an, this is a bit of an exact science, which us as teachers probably just can't do. We were always talking about the fact that if we, when we revisit a new topic, they are literally just about to forget that topic, when we reintroduce it to them, it actually increases the retrieval strength of that information again. Now, I can't tell you with the 30 kids that I teach when someone's literally about to forget it. I can't be in middle grade through a conversation and go, die, tell me that, okay? I physically don't know what's going on. There's no like indicator or level above their head. So we've had to start thinking about organizing a way where we can simply and pragmatically have that spacing going on in the lessons that we're doing. <coughs> so there are opportunities where we are increasing the gap between revisiting old units, old topic, old information, where it's probably getting wider and wider and wider, so they're just forgetting it, and again when we revisit, trying to re-trigger those memories, fight up those neurons, and trying to build up that retrieval strength and make it much stronger so it becomes more accessible. Testing. So that you go okay. with testing. Uh, so reading, uh, <laughs> uh, reading uh, with Bjork, he very much says that testing is actually one way that students will actually learn better than just hitting the books. I read what I read last night. Better than just hitting the books, actually doing testing. Uh, and I know both of you, when it comes, well, both of us, when it comes to our revision, we will very much hit kids with exam questions, exam questions, exam questions that we need test, to, uh, rather than just making them recover the information. Um, and we have built that in even further um, to the fact that we have pre-tests at the start of a new unit. So when we start a new unit, before we've taught them anything, we will give them a multiple choice pre-test. And I'll come on to why multiple choice in a moment. Um, and it just helpfully helps them to see that they've actually got some of this prior learning already in there. They've covered it through other topics, other subjects in the school, or for what they know that's going on in the world around them. Um, and hopefully they can, you know, when we come on to teach them new areas, they've got that prior learning. Um, and multiple choice Bjork found actually um, allowed students to <coughs> learn better because even if they didn't know the answer or they don't know the answer, especially where it is a pre-test, they can use their thought process to deduct and work out <coughs> which is the wrong answer, which is likely to be the wrong answer. And actually I think probably we both find with our pre-test, quite often students do much better than we think they're going to do because they do use that logic, they do sit there and work it down, uh, and break, sorry, break it down and work it out. The, the, the pre-test as well, especially with the multiple choice that we do within our subject, is also it fires out cues to so students. They've already heard the word in the pre-test, so when we actually then go to teach it in the subsequent lessons, they're like, oh, I've heard it, okay? And that again helps make the storage strength um, of when we're actually delivering topics and so on to, 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 to commit it from the working memory to long-term memory. Um, tests don't have to be boring, okay? I'm going to show you how we've actually tried to fire things up a little bit. And we aren't literally saying, in your lessons, you must, every... Um, Every week, we get the exam and silence and that sort of stuff. We're going to come up with some different ways um, and show you some different ways of what we do to try and make the testing really low stakes. Okay? Um, we do a lot of things individually, in pairs, in groups, we have challenges and that sort of thing. Um, you can get to 21 facts before anyone else. Do you know what I mean? So, lots of different things for students are actually having to retrieve that information from their, their memory. Okay? So, these are our problems. Okay? Fran and I have did a lot of research and, and sat down in many a meeting. Um, See when I used to walk to Fran's office, she'd be with closed curtains or closed door or something like that, or the meeting in progress on the door and, and trying to hide. Um, but we started thinking, how are we actually going to get this across? Because Fran and I had an understanding. The two other colleagues in our year, uh, with our year group that we were working with, didn't know much about this. So we need to think of a way that we can map it out so that students can actually, actually have a full understanding. So we have to think about the lesson we designed, are there high levels of thinking? How can we reduce quantum overload? Um, the storage strength, when we're introducing topics, how can we do that better? Uh, the order, implementing spacing, practically, I'm going to show you the OCD <coughs> gateway and how it didn't work. Um, testing, which is fun, okay? Fun and low stakes, uh, and actually interleave in a magical way, because 
with the, like I said, the time limitation we've got, we couldn't go diet, then do physiology, and then do diet again. And we could do that. We have to, we have to keep moving on, but in a, in, a, um, in a really simple way. So the first thing we did is um, <coughs> thinking. As I said, the brain didn't like thinking, but it doesn't like to think. Uh, it prefers, obviously, to work automatically. So we tried to get the idea of getting the problem-solving element in our lesson. So in our lessons, um, we do lots of different things. So um, I've got this one. Um, Driving questions. When the students come into our lesson, okay, nice and simply, um, we use lots of driving questions. We use driving questions for the unit as well. And this was actually the unit, unit three, driving question we had. So it wasn't just for the lesson. This is something we re revisit in all of our unit three lessons. And it was what factors do athletes need in order to reach and maintain a suitable fitness level for their sport. Okay. So students are automatically having that curiosity perked up and tweaked up and that sort of thing. And they're, they're already trying to think, oh, I don't know actually, what is it? And we actually get lots of discussions from the mm -hmm. students in our lesson from doing and using driving questions just to start things going. And then when we actually then start presenting them the actual information and knowledge they need to use, then it all falls into place and keeps them understanding and that story strength is there. We just did a Skype session with Mark Adams from British Cycling and straight afterwards I could see that Mark talked for a long time, okay? I could see the glazed face from one of my students. Okay? So I needed to follow up with the thinking behind it. And even though during the Skype session they had prompt questions had to answer, I then yesterday caught them, brought them back at lunchtime and I said, right, here's some work you need to do for next Wednesday. And they had to, um, or they will have to, answer these questions to try and get them to think about what it was Mark was saying. And little things like this. Um, I know that solo taxonomy can be a swear word to some people, um, but I'm, we use it in our department because it's just a very easy way to plan for ourselves. Okay? Uh, it works really well and it helps us to, to map out and think what level of thinking are we using in our lessons. Okay? And when we get students up towards the high level, the extended abstract, we get students to start thinking at a really high level but about other topics and things like this. So using solo taxonomy for us is a great way to tick off. Are we actually getting kids to think? And if they weren't, what can we do using the taxonomy as sort of like just a, a prompt to get us to do it? How can we actually get the kids to think of this at a higher level or a more challenging level? So assessing the level of thinking about our lesson was a great way of, of like our first step. We keep constantly revisit our lesson plans and ticking it off. If it's not, <coughs> we've got that challenge, not got the problem solving going on, then we'll be tweak stuff. Comes some overload. There we go, okay. <laughs> In our lesson as well, uh, to minimise cognitive overload as well, we really now, because if we know it, if we don't plan this any differently, we're very conscious about how clear our explanations are. We minimise what we're saying in terms of um, bursts of information. We still have our teacher talk because we're firm believers we need to teach the kids, okay? Um, we don't let them go off and learn themselves, we're very much there going for it. Uh, but we think about how we're introducing new information and what things can we use to help support them learning that new information so there isn't that cognitive overload going on. So for instance, before students were doing an eight mark exam question, although PE is quite difficult, we have two essay questions, right? <laughs> no one believes us, they think PE is easy, but the kids really struggle with the theory side. Um, so before the other two eight mark essay questions, we asked them um, in the practice to actually use a graphic organiser, um, simply IDEA, just a simple way that the exam answer is going to be structured, um, could do it for a PED as well, if you want to do that sort of thing, even though I'm not a fan of that, you are. Um, just to try and get them to map out their thinking in a nice logical order to make what's going on in that work and memory easy to grapple with what's going on in the long term memory and make that learning a little bit more easier. Things like when we use um, new definitions and so on like that, we use uh, Lee Donaghy, if you ever follow him on Twitter, um, he uses something called genre pedagogy which we are trying to slowly build into the way we're developing our literacy in our subjects as well. Um, <coughs> and he uses this thing, the four part process where students map out their definitions. And we do it only because we want students to nice and clearly learn that definition, think about that definition, manipulate that definition, and so on. So my students now don't use the box, they now put the little breaks in their paragraphs. And then my more able students have now got to the stage where they just write paragraphs because this process has now become automatic and so on. So cognitively thinking, and the working memory in mind, we made it nice and easy to go through. And little things as well at the bottom, other graphic organisers such as like spider diagrams. Um, little templates, prompt sheets and some of that to try and make sure that what we're teaching students actually sticks and they can actually work with that information in an easy way so it's accessible in working memory and can get committed that a little bit easier. For 10 minutes. Okay, this was... Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Dave came down to my office. Do you want to click onto the slide? Next one. Okay. Uh, with this. 
trying to, and I'm sure he can explain it better, but basically I looked at that and thought, I've no idea how we're possibly, as he said, going to keep repeating the topics, because with GCSEP it's a lot of content, um, and it was just no way we could do it. So they then came back with another template.